content note. Please be aware all lived ex talks discuss the topics of ableism and discrimination of people with disability in some way. Specific written content warnings will be given prior to each talk. If these topics cause you any distress, please call Lifeline on 13 1114 for 24 7 individual crisis support within Australia. Or you can text 0477 131114 between the hours of 12 pm to 12 am AEST. Hello everyone, my name is Jason McCurry and I am the Youth Leadership and Development Officer with Children and Young People with Disability Australia, or CIDA as we often refer to it. My pronouns are he and him. To give you a bit of a visual description of myself, I have short brown hair, I have blue eyes and I'm wearing a black t-shirt with a purple pronoun pin. Children and Young People with Disability Australia, or CIDA as we commonly refer to it, is a national representative organisation for children and young people with disability across Australia. We play an important part in linking and communicating the lived experiences of children and young people across Australia to the Australian Government and other key stakeholders. CIDA hosted the inaugural 2020 National Youth Disability Summit earlier this year. Taking place entirely online, the summit took place between the 29th of September and the 3rd of October 2020. The summit was exclusively for young Australians aged between 15 and 30 who are living with a disability to come together, to connect, to discuss and advocate in a youth only environment. We are well aware that young people with disability are the experts in their own lives and have a lot of knowledge to share with the wider community outside of the youth disability community. What you're about to see is a presentation of the lived ex session. Five of our summit co-design committee members wanted to share their stories, knowledge and lived experiences to educate, inform and engage the wider community. Tim Lachlan, Tim Chan, Poppy Mullins, Alicia Staples and Kahava Lillette have openly and courageously prepared these talks to share with you. Enjoy, listen and engage. Here is Lived X. Tim Lachlan, he, him, developing confidence in yourself and your abilities. It's amazing what life lessons and experiences a wheelchair and concrete have brought me over the years. I've become the first Australian to land a wheelchair backflip. I've traveled to the United States to skate with some of the world's best WCMX riders. I've recovered from two mild traumatic brain injuries and the bullying that came with them. I've experienced both highs and lows. All the opportunities and experiences I've had wouldn't be possible if I didn't have disabilities. I'm thankful for these experiences because they have shaped me as a person. I don't know where I'd be if I didn't have this amazing sport. My name is Timothy Lachlan. I'm 23 years old. I have hypermobility spectrum disorder and autism. I'm a third year occupational therapy student, wheelchair motocross rider, fabricator and disability advocate. I aim to help all people with disabilities live their best lives, and I believe that anything is possible if we adapt the task and the environment to fit the person. I love sport because it places the focus on our strengths. It proves that disability isn't shameful, that using a wheelchair is not the worst thing that can happen to a person, and in fact it's quite the opposite. Wheelchairs enable us to participate in life. That's why I love WCMX so much. It takes the wheelchair, a device portrayed by the media to represent pain and suffering, and it turns it on its head. It shows that wheelchairs can be used to achieve cool tricks and awesome feats, that the wheelchair is not a prison, but a tool to access freedom. I'm not saying that you have to throw yourself down a 10-foot ramp to gain confidence in yourself or your abilities. Just try push out of your comfort zone every once in a while. Push your limits and see what you're really capable of. Don't let people tell you that you shouldn't be out there enjoying life just because you have a disability. Getting involved in sport is a great way to build confidence and resilience. Sport helps you stay healthy and improve your strength and coordination, which benefits you in daily life. I was 11 before I got into WCMX. 
I relied entirely on wheelchair access. I couldn't wheelie or go down curbs or stairs. If you asked me if I could drop in, I would have noped right out of there. Now I can go where I want. I've dropped 13.5 foot vert ramps. I can roll over sand, gravel, rough terrain, and steep hills. The environment can't hold me back now that I've learned advanced mobility skills. Once you begin to develop confidence in your physical abilities, you tend to gain self-confidence over time too. Your self-esteem and belief in yourself improves. Your mood improves and you become more able to adapt to changes in your life with your newly gained strengths. The ability to adapt is a vital skill, especially for us people with disabilities. A harsh reality of having a disability is the lack of access in our built environments. Stairs, curbs, push-pull doors, steep ramps are just some examples of access barriers we meet in daily life. I'm going to demonstrate how people with a disability can overcome barriers in the physical environment, but also talk about why this skill alone is not enough. So I'm going to show how I access a 10 foot ramp that doesn't have access to the top, no stairs, nothing. It's at a really fun BMX park that also happens to be really inaccessible to wheelchairs. I start with the tree arborist technique and use a carabiner to weight the end of some thin line. I throw the line over the bar, this sometimes takes multiple attempts. Once I get the line and the carabiner back to me, I attach the rope, loop it over the top railing, and then I grab the free end and throw it over the transition side of the ramp. I then tie the loose end of the rope to my foot plate, I get out of my chair, and I use what abilities I have to climb up to the coping and pull myself up. You may consider me inspiring for having climbed up a ramp and done a 10 foot drop in. Am I inspiring for adapting, or am I inspiring because the inspiration comes from a place of pity? Do I remind people that they could be worse off, so to speak? Although it's cool that I can go to the skate park and use a tree arborist technique to climb up a large ramp, it doesn't address the underlying need for disability access to be built into that skate park, to enable people with disabilities and other park users to access the full features of the park. Not every person with a disability will be able to climb ramps like I can, as level of disability varies from person to person. Depending on a person's needs, you would adapt this technique by using a climbing harness and a pulley, and they'd climb up just like a tree arborist. However, access should not be something a person with a disability has to create for themselves. This is where universal design is key to solving this problem. People often think of access as this pesky thing that only a minority called people with disabilities need, and that's not the case at all. If we installed wheelchair accessible ramps to the main features of the park, not only would more people with disabilities be able to access the park, you would see the curb cut effect taking place. That is where park goers of all abilities use the ramps. Some would use the ramps to get access to the top of the vert ramp that they previously had to pump to get up to the top of. Beginners would ride down the gentle slope of the ramp to get a feel for the park, while also keeping them in a safe space away from advanced riders. In becoming accessible, we encourage inclusion and we normalize disability. WCMX proves that people with disabilities can achieve what they want. Using a wheelchair isn't a bad thing. Our wheelchairs allow us to be active, take part in life, and do cool tricks along the way. We're more than objects of inspiration and pity. We are people, and our use of mobility equipment or our diagnosis doesn't make us any less human, and it doesn't mean we should be treated as any less human. I hope what I do demonstrates that people with disabilities are capable and can achieve their goals with the right adaptations and supports. Don't be afraid to speak up for your rights if you experience injustice. Remember to take an educational approach when asking for access or advocating for equality. People don't know better unless we teach them, and we must teach them in a positive way so that they listen. Conduct access audits of local businesses. Contact the council, your local member, make a petition. Go to the Human Rights Commission. Do what you can to bring about change. We as people with disabilities have come so far in the last 50 years, but we still have a way to go. Remember that you are stronger than you think, and disability gives you a unique perspective. Use it to your advantage. Take care of yourself, and be well. Tim Chan, he, him.
My Travels with Autism. Wait. Mike. Two. Talk. About. My. Journey. Two. Become. Disability Advocate Hi, I am Tim Chan. I would like to talk about my journey to become a disability advocate. I was diagnosed with autistic disorder at three, with severe of elemental delays in cognition, social understanding and communication. I do not speak despite intensive intervention and speech therapy. Instead, I have learned to use alternative and augmentative communication with my preferred mode as typing with support to communicate, a method which I was taught at nine years old. I also had severe hypersensitivities, overload, movement difficulties, dyspraxia, information processing issues and very high levels of anxiety as well. My autistic challenges have brought on painful incidents of discrimination. One incident occurred in grade three when we students with disability were routinely assessed. The process was traumatic because I was unable to do any test guide and as I don't speak or type independently. The school psychologist informed mum that I was severely autistic right in front of me, but the psychologist never saw or acknowledged me as a person. Because I couldn't do any of the assessment tasks, I failed the test, and felt like an apology of a human being, and at nine years old, it's a heavy burden. In a subsequent report, the psychologist also labelled me as severely intellectually disabled. This report indicated that I would be unlikely to adjust well at mainstream high school. On the other hand, in school classes, I was able to work at grade level with the support of a fantastic aide, but this didn't count in the assessment. It was devastating because I went through years of home-based program, early intervention, speech and other therapy to help me learn. If the assessment had been based on my strengths as a visual thinker, with good receptive language, memory and discriminatory skills, it would give me the hope necessary to work towards mastery of skills to become independent. Through intensive efforts from family and the primary school, I was enrolled in a mainstream high school. But it was obvious from day one that the school did not understand nor support my complex communication needs. Furthermore, they did their best to persuade me to leave, with constant reminders that I should seek dual enrollment with a special school or simply transfer to another school. In years seven and eight, the school prohibited my, my typing to communicate. My lie tried to sat in the aide's desk during school hours. They also segregated me in the resource room when I hummed or laid down to manage my sensory issues. I had resorted to splashing water to manage my overload and anxiety. And this was serious transgression in their eyes. My mum was called to pick me up early almost daily, and I was suspended as well. Because I was unable to type to talk at school during this time, I felt extremely isolated and vulnerable. Furthermore, this restriction prevented me from participating in classwork. I was often in the library or in the resource room, doing preschool work like counting or colouring with my aide. I went through a very dark patch in which I felt completely isolated and alienated, and very much the outsider. I lost all motivation for going to school and for learning, with occasional thoughts of self-harm. 
to family arranged for mental health intervention and I was treated by a child psychiatrist over six years. Finally, through the strenuous efforts of mum and disability advocates in negotiating for reasonable adjustments, I was given permission to type with my aid in year nine. With the means of communication, I managed to complete high school with the support of empathic school staff. On the other hand, I wasn't able to VCE under their strict assessment guidelines due to high anxiety, sensory overload and motor difficulties. The school administration actually discouraged me by saying that VCE wasn't the pathway for me and instigated funding for post-school transition to disability programs. This funding provided alternative options for disabled school leavers and I went to Kevin Hines Grove a horticultural program to prepare for open employment. I felt that educators, other professionals, as well as the general public often judge me on the basis of my autistic challenges, like lack of speech and sensory issues. My obsessive rituals like hand flapping and humming, the strategies for managing constant anxiety and overload, were unacceptable. There is a prevailing attitude of ableism with expectations to behave in conventional ways that are penalizing people with disability. Because of our challenges, we are judged as disabled and lacking in the wherewithal to achieve what most people would take for granted, including mainstream education or taking part in community activities. I believe that with a different strength-based approach and the right support, we can achieve our potential and work towards access and participation. In my case, I was lucky to have my mum who believes in me and her unconditional support. Mum never took the professional's gloomy prognosis seriously, but gave her son the necessary resources to develop and participate, in school and out. Over the years, mum and my advocates took on the education and other institutions, to give me the best opportunities to learn and engage with life. It has been a long, hard road but with the support of family, advocates and others, I feel I am making headway. I spent four years at a post-school horticultural program before summoning up the courage to go back to formal study. This is my third year of university, studying sociology and politics. I did a TED talk in 2013, presumably the first autistic non-speaker to do so. I have also participated in conferences, focus groups and committees. In 2019, my autobiography, Back from the Brink, was published and launched, and I joined the growing circle of autistic authors. Because I have had to push for my rights, I am keen to advocate for other people with disability, to give them opportunities which are routinely denied. Through the work of my advocates as well as organizations like CIDA, I'm learning about advocacy to raise awareness of disability and to make a difference. I have found advocating for people with disability, especially those without speech, very rewarding, and I am grateful I can use my experiences to help others. My rocky journey has opened a pathway for me to help people in the same boat and to have opportunities for a meaningful life. Alicia Staples, my creative work life, the journey so far, and where I would like to go.
For those of you that don't know, I have a rare genetic condition on the 18 chromosome. It means that one, there's a tiny bit missing. So that's how different I am from most babies and most kids. So that tiny little bit of me that's inside, it hasn't held me back all this time and it's, I just want people to know that this is, this is what I am, I'm, I'm who I am. And I can't change that. Um, I had a heart failure and a congenital heart disease. It was quite scary at first, and then I thought, oh my god, what am I doing here? It doesn't affect me, but sometimes I have seizures. I started, you know, getting fuzzy. And I was like, oh no, what's going on? And then as soon as my eyes started to open, there were people like, you know, over me, checking if I was okay. And I thought to myself, why is there so many people around me? And my granddad was saying, well, you had a seizure. And I'm like, didn't I? And I was like, oh, I didn't feel anything, but I felt something was gonna happen. It's scary when, when you feel it at first, but then you have to try and prepare before you might have the seizure, so yeah. Primary school was fun. I got to graduate with my class in um, 2008 and graduating from a mainstream school was, it made me feel like I was one of them, like a person without a condition because that's what I want to feel like. I want to feel like a normal person and it's, it's difficult not knowing about it, but then when you know it, you move on with it. When I graduated in primary school, I, I've always wanted to go to Brisbane State High. And it's because my, my sister went there. The sad thing about that was that there was no special education in Brisbane State High, so that's when we moved up here on the sunny coast to go to Mullaney State High because that had a special education there. Mullaney High School was the best school because I got to go on camps like in New Gully and I also got to do carnivals like swimming athletics, cross country, and also do some fun things uh, like go to Bellingham Maze and Aussie World and some of the coolest places like Stradbroke Island we went there like in year 11 and I think the reason my disability didn't hold me back because I kept going and I had so many opportunities in schools, I've been on camps and it's just been an amazing experience and that's never hold me back and I've never gave up. The teachers gave me a lot of support, you know, with the homework and we did like fun things on computers and we had our own computer. Mullaney High School gave me a lot of support. So when I graduated from high school, I'd always wanted to travel. The first time that I tried for a job was at Mullaney Library. And I gotta say honestly, it was too quiet for me. And I guess the hardest thing for me was not being able to talk as loud as I could because 
that's what I am. I talk a lot all the time and it's, I can't help it sometimes. It just comes out of my system. Mainstream of me was a program to educate people about young people with disabilities. It was basically everything about job interviews, resumes, and the things to do to get into a job. And it was like the best experience that I had. So mainstream of me went to job places to deliver the presentations of how to get a job and our job was to try and convince the people that we want to get a job, we want to we want to have a normal life and then we can bring a lot to the workplace. So I was doing a presentation up in Melbourne with the mainstream and me crew and I did my presentation did what I had to do and then next minute the CEO of Bush Kids gave me his business card and I was like ooh lucky lucky so I was on the money and I got headhunted my job at Bush Kids is the resource assistant my job is to do folders and rip them up, make them done nicely and uh, cut up a lot of stuff. It's a lot more fun and bubbly and last year I went to my first Christmas party with them and it was, it was just the best experience with them because I had a met a new, long new friends and so my creative life was the performing arts and my first passion for the arts was dancing and I actually first started when I was a teeny tiny little girl and I had you know, my auntie, my brother, my sister, my mom, and I had everyone, you know, help me, you know, get my legs moving and, you know, get them running and dancing and, you know, just getting them moving. And when I dance, I love to give a message to people about that type of awareness of when you meet someone with a disability, it's important not to say something behind their back because um, they think that you're talking about them and it's not right. So Sunshine Troop is a dance slash theater group for people with intellectual disabilities. And we do theatre, we do dance, we do a lot of comedy, and we do a lot of fun. We have about 10 people in our group so far, and yeah, we started in 2010. I was one of the originals. Well, we've been doing a lot about community and a lot about negative words and positive words like we give positive messages we don't give negative but we start with the negative and then we come out with a positive message saying we want you to understand that people with disabilities is a normal thing we did a little short film called luminosity and I gotta tell you, it was a big hit at the Sunshine Coast Theatre Festival because when we showed it at the opening night, everyone loved it, including our fellow performances. And it was it was quite interesting to see a lot of people's faces go, "Ooh, uh, like," and like. 
We worked with fabulous people like Florence Tillier, who is a creative director and a very lovely French woman. And it was just amazing to, to do that kind of short film, you know, being in the dark and then seeing light again. It was, it was just amazing. So I went to uh, Sydney to do a residency with Catalyst for two years and um, I got to do a workshop with an Aboriginal woman named Janoa Jella and she is one of the most inspiring women ever because she is a strong advocate for Aboriginal people. Um, so yeah, I went to Scotland and Glasgow to do a residency with Caroline Bowditch and it was really fun to get a lot of thoughts and a lot of tips from her because she's a choreographer or theatre person like herself because she's still a person, you know, who makes art. The US, I went with my mum and we went to New York and then we went to Boston and we went to a uh, chromosome 18 conference and it was one of the best conferences I've ever been because um, I met a lot, I saw a lot of my friends like when I was when I used to be very little and I haven't met them fully before so to actually meet them for the first time it was oh it was so good. I was in New Caledonia with my colleague Florence and my mum. What I was doing in New Caledonia I was uh, going to like a it's kind of like a mini conference kind of thing and it was actually my first time as a performer going to another country so I had a lovely time there but the worst thing about that was it was like the food was great but the food was all chicken and I gotta say it was the most boring thing ever I loved the trip but no more chicken Well, I work with my own disability self-advocacy group called Loud and Clear, and it's a Queensland-based self-advocacy group. And there is a ton of fabulous people with disabilities there. And um, I am a representative of the Our Voice, which it is a, a committee for all the states so it's basically a voice to the government i'm part of a other arts group called ahar ensemble and it's it's a pretty good mixture of people with disabilities and with no disabilities and we're working with a collaboration with fluxus which is a dance group it's a mainstream group that we love. I'm also doing another collaboration with Silk Circus which is with the Sunshine Troupe and basically what we're doing is we've been doing things of the circus like human pyra pyramids and you know back-to-back -back things and acrobat things and with the Sunshine Troupe and Silk Circus, we put them together and we make a show. You'd be quite surprised at how good mainstream and people with disabilities can work together. When we work with mainstream people, we work very closely together. So we're kind of like family. My hopes and dreams for the future is to 
go and see celebrities and make a YouTube channel for myself because I want people to know the real me. What I'm trying to say is I'm wanting to have like a wider community with, you know, a lot more support and it's, it's important because we've had a lot of struggles this year and it's going to be hard but if we keep working together it's going to be a great you know end of 2020 whether or not it's still COVID-19. I got the determination but the community better be open because I'm just sick and tired of hearing the same old story every time. Well, I want to see more people, you know, on Netflix that has young people with disabilities like me. Because all we're seeing is, you know, Ryan Gosling, Harrison Ford, Luke Hamill. Where's, you know, the cool people? Mitchell Runcy, myself. I mean, come on. I wonder if any of you have a star that either has an intellectual disability or is in a wheelchair. You can't think of one, can you? Mm-hmm. Well, I can tell you one person or a couple of people. Dylan Alcock, tennis player. Caroline Bowditch, she's in a wheelchair. We have Madeline Stewart. She's a person with a disability. She went from sitting on the sitting watching the catwalk to being on the catwalk. And then you got someone like the gymnast with Down syndrome. She went on and did other things. They've had the love and the support and the commitment and the community that gave them that one chance. And before I go, there are three tips that I want to leave you with. Never give up on your dreams. That's the most important thing. Have family, friends, support your colleagues. Have them there around you. Be open with the community. Talk to your friends. Talk to people, even strangers. Just have a piece of kindness in your heart because kindness always matters. Poppy Mullins, she, her, veiled inequality, deconstructing the one-size-fits-all approach in inclusive education. My name is Poppy Mullins. I am 16 years of age and I feel honoured to be standing here before you today as a member of the inaugural National Youth Disability Summit Co-Design Committee. There are a lot of annoying sayings in the disability sector, aren't there? And most of them directly contradict each other. In one breath, you need to be more independent. In the next, you need to learn to ask for help. On Monday, the teacher aide takes over your work 
and on Tuesday, the teacher aides adjust your hands. Can I start by acknowledging the wonderful intentions that brought inclusive education into being? The problem is, we need to take the next step and destroy the foundations of that metaphorical wall that stands between people like me and achieving in the way that we want. We need to eradicate the one-size-fits-all approach to, to inclusivity. We have come a long way since the sympathy-laced ideals that are reflected in expressions like confined to a wheelchair or wilt or wheelchair bound and we've done much to reduce the othering created by words like spastic and retard but we've still got a long way to go with that one what i'm talking about is a kind of inequality inequality disguised as acceptance a one-size-fits-all approach that sees us as people but refuses to acknowledge us as individuals. I have had some experience with this kind of veiled inequality. Sure, I need physical help, but in my case, I've never required any kind of cognitive support, nor have I needed an adjusted curriculum. My main educational priority has always been academic achievement, and yet, this is where I felt the veil has been the most detrimental. In early middle school, the teachers I worked with could not have done more to help compensate the potential negative social outcomes that could have resulted from my physical difficulties. And for this, I am extremely grateful. Inside the classroom, my aggravation had started to grow. By year nine, I had really started to love academic pursuits and my success had seen this become an element of my identity in which I was, and still am, really proud. At this stage in the classroom, I did just need a a teacher aide to be my hands, what I got was a well-intentioned person whose lack of technical expertise, particularly with word processing, was the cause of significant distress, not just for me, but for her. I know why I was assigned this aid, and again, the intention was not malicious. My program managers wanted me to be more dependent, but the problem was, this approach increased my anxiety because I was so worried about the potential impact on my academic outcomes and hence a part of my identity felt threatened. Ever since I started high school, a great report card has meant a lot to me. What this has resulted in is some very mixed messages. Teacher aides are unsure of how to best assist me. Here I need to add that I have had some amazing tea trades, but really until now, what I've always felt was that as a young person who was clearly disabled, the institution automatically assumed I needed assistance to understand information when what I really needed was just someone who understood the technology I used understood my intellect and ability and understood the specifics of how I worked in general and what was needed for them to adequately support me. The outcome of that experience showed me that the system I was in, by default of being disabled, had just as many flaws as it did merit. I am in no way insinuating that my experience is a symbol for everyone with disability. I have never been physically or verbally bullied due to my disability. I have never participated in an, in an alternate version of the curriculum without my consent. What I am trying to get across, however, 
is that clearly with the system as it currently is, it is wrong to call the disability education sector truly inclusive. We're all still as one homogenous group held back by the one size fits all ideology. That is, we all have the same abilities and interests. It is this approach that's been perpetuated in our schools and our workplaces. This is the approach that we need to dismantle or if we truly want to call our education inclusive. Still, this fails in quality is far less when compared to the blatant injustice that many of us still experience even before school starts, the struggle that is the process of enrolment. It was shown in a Senate inquiry completed in 2016 that many schools refuse or subtly try to turn away students with disabilities on the grounds that they cannot provide the student appropriate education because of their special needs or any challenges that might occur with that student. My own parents had to put forward a case to justify my so-called mainstream primary school enrolment. But it can't stop at getting your name on a roll and someone to help you out in class. Teacher aides need to be trained adequately to support students with disabilities in a predominantly digital environment. And time needs to be provided to allow for more collaboration between teacher aides and classroom teachers. But most importantly, students need to be involved in this process so that measures can be put in place to meet their needs and appeal to their interests so that they can reach their goals. As a friend of mine recently said, the problem with schools is that there isn't enough segregation. Why should a student with severe anxiety or an intellectual impairment be expected to complete exams for his age level in a classroom exactly the same way as his peers? No. Absolutism is not the answer. So then how do we dismantle this metaphorical war? With a system that promotes equality but is truly equitable. And to do this, the institution must pay for time. Time for teacher aides, teachers and students to have regular meetings, to develop and implement strategies. Time that will allow teachers to fully understand their role in assisting individual students to succeed in the way that they want. Time to develop the digital literacy skills required to support students in the 21st century, perhaps with the opportunity to gain certificates and qualifications as they do so. It is my hope that if we begin to act now, the foundations of that metaphorical wall will be shattered and no student will ever have to experience the annoyance and the blatant ignorance of the one-size-fits-all approach. Kahava Lilit Z Z A Disability Introduction to Transformative Justice When I talk about the abuse I've experienced as a mad queer crip Jew, the responses run the gauntlet from kind and compassionate to I can relate to you deserved it. When I told my then-girlfriend about the time I was assaulted for stimming in public, she said, those people should be in prison. 
when I talked about the woman who followed me and another disabled friend down several streets to interrogate us about whether we were really disabled and how dare we use things that real disabled people might need, another abled friend later said, if I was there I would have called the cops. It's meant to be a supportive response. I see your hurt, I understand your pain. That shouldn't have happened to anyone. People shouldn't be allowed to do that. But it doesn't feel supportive because I know that the ideals and ideologies that create a society where ableism is normalized and disabled people are devalued and dismissed are intertwined with the ideas behind the system of prisons and police that we have today. Prisons rely on the idea that some people are disposable. The image of the criminal as someone who has forfeited their rights and deserves to suffer is a major part of modern prison discourse. But the criminal as they appear in these conversations is not a coherent concept. Say this to an advocate for prisons and they'll protest. They mean people who break the law should face the consequences. And that's all they mean by criminal, a person who breaks the law. Have you ever pirated a movie? Crossed the road against a red light because it was late and there are no cars anyway then you have broken the law and you are a criminal. So am I. So are the people who say that people who break the law should face the consequences because they're criminals. Because they don't really mean people who break the law. Everyone breaks some laws sometime. They mean criminals. Scary people. People you wouldn't want to be around. Why? That depends who's speaking. Often it means queer people. People of colour, especially black people. Disabled people, especially mentally ill people. Poor people. Immigrants. People who already exist on the margins of society. But it doesn't have to be. Those of us in progressive spaces can traffic in this ideology too. Our images of who is a threat will be different, but when Martin Shkreli, the man who increased the cost of vital medication from about $13 US to $750 US, was convicted and sentenced to prison, it's harder for many of us to want to object. The system we have looks a little bit more like it makes sense. But he was arrested for fraud, not for exploiting people who need medication. And the price of many medications, owned by many different companies, is still a burden that too many chronically ill people can't bear. Our current carceral system may occasionally provide the illusion of justice, but it does nothing to heal the harms caused or address the root causes of those harms. In this, what it offers us is a safety net, not as a protection for society, but as a way to protect ourselves from having to deal with the hard questions of how to ethically engage with people who have caused real harm in our communities. But we cannot absolve ourselves of the consequences of a society that relies on prisons or of the harms they cause. Prisons serve to isolate people from their communities and their support systems. Within prisons, many inmates face abuse from staff and the power disparities leave them with little recourse. 
People in prisons are routinely exploited, forced to pay exorbitant prices for basic necessities and the means to contact friends and family outside the prison system. They're exploited through prison labour programs. In an article for The Guardian, Kevin Rashid Johnson and describes his experience in prison. Though I've always refused to engage in this modern slavery myself, I've witnessed plenty of examples of it. The most extreme were in Texas and Florida, where prisoners were forced to work in the fields for free, entirely unremunerated. Prisoners who did not agree to such abject slavery were put in solitary confinement. Disabled people are dramatically overrepresented in prisons. In a Human Rights Watch interview, The Horror of Australia's Prisons, researcher Kriti Sharma res responds to the question, how is it that 50% of Australia's prison population has a disability? 18% of Australia's general population has a disability. The most common type of disabilities found in prisons are mental health conditions. People with disabilities are not more criminal than anyone else, but the lack of comprehensive mental health and social services has created a pathway to prison for many people with disabilities. Many are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Research shows that most of the offences they committed are less serious than offences committed by others. A failure to pay fines, traffic violations, or public order offences. Kriti Sharma also describes the abuse that disabled prisoners face. Under international law, solitary confinement is being locked up in a room for 22 hours or more per day without meaningful social interaction. Across the prisons I visited, you see people with disabilities, particularly mental health conditions, kept in solitary for days, weeks, months, and sometimes even years. When a prisoner goes into this unit, they have no one to talk to. Lights are on 24-7, making it hard to sleep. They have no mental health support. They have to wear a suicide-proof gown. They're given finger food to eat, so no utensils. All this happens to them when they are having a crisis, when they're crying out for help, and they experience this as punishment. Prisons are not the only institutions where disabled people are abused and have our rights denied. Anti-prison activists and disabled activists are fighting many of the same battles. Disabled people can be confined in medical and psychiatric services, nursing homes and group homes without our consent far too often. Under compulsory treatment orders, mentally ill people have many of our rights stripped away, can be forced to stay in a hospital or mental health clinic without our consent, and have treatments or medication forced on us against our will. Mental health care is vital, but for that very reason, turning it into a threat or a tool for control used without respect for the person consent, human rights, or autonomy is reprehensible, and it erodes trust in the mental health care system, creating yet another barrier to accessing mental health for multiply marginalized people. In Freedom for Some is Not Freedom for All, disability activist Alice Wong wrote, Congregant care settings do not ensure safety or care. By design, institutions do not allow us to know the conditions of the people incarcerated inside. They are allowed to operate without transparency and accountability. They render people as less than human, subject to exploitation, abuse, and neglect. The systems that exist now don't have to remain the same. We must dismantle the nursing home industry that places profits over lives as they endanger their workers and operate with inadequate oversight and regulation. And we must work towards decarceration and deinstitutionalization because these systems are dangerous, inhumane, and unjust. Confining people in prisons and confining disabled people in so-called care institutions are painfully similar issues. 
They treat some people as disposable and isolate us because separating us from the rest of society seems like an easier default than providing genuine and appropriate care to everyone who needs it. We are part of societies that built these institutions or committed other wrongs and continue to oppress disabled people. We are also part of societies that said no. We will not allow this to continue anymore. We bear responsibility for what is happening around us, but we also have the option to draw strength from the incredible activist mo movements that continue around us. Transformative justice is not a simple solution. It invites us to imagine a world without prisons, and from that starting point to look beyond punitive systems and create many alternatives that support and empower a wide range of different people in a wide range of different communities. In transformative justice, we create space for victims to decide for themselves what they need to heal, for communities to recognize their obligations in providing support and in holding others to account, and we create opportunities for perpetrators to understand and address the harm they caused and do what they can to make things better. It's an intentionally flexible process that recognizes that what works in one situation may not, will not work in another. Transformative justice looks at the systems and communities we live in and asks, what are the conditions that allowed harm to occur? What are the conditions that would need to exist to have prevented this harm from occurring in the first place? These questions mean that transformative justice approaches are able to achieve systemic change by recognizing that while the perpetrator is absolutely responsible for what they did, the community is responsible for making long-term systemic changes and creating societies in which it's the conditions that led to this harm don't arise as often or ideally again. It means investing our resources in education, in welfare, in healthcare, not in the exact forms they're in today, but as ways of giving everyone access to learning and knowledge, to material support, and to medical health care, including mental health care, without asking them to submit themselves to a degrading or dehumanizing system. Transformative justice can involve formal or informal mediation between people. It can mean supporting the victim to talk to the person or people who harmed them. It can mean supporting them to be in their communities or alone in their own space without having to engage with whoever harmed them if that's the route they choose to take. It might involve the perpetrator doing very concrete work to directly repair the harm that they caused, or helping the victim directly, or doing other work to help other people. It might be that they, with other people to support them and keep them accountable, learn better coping skills, or work on themselves to make sure they won't repeat the harm. It might mean that they, temporarily or permanently, remove themselves from specific groups or community spaces that the victim is also part of if the victim wants access to those spaces without having to interact with the perpetrator. It's a form of taking responsibility and ownership for the consequences of the harm they caused. It means recognizing that the person who caused harm often needs to heal too, and recognizing that that is not a burden or responsibility to place on the victim. Transformative justice is far from perfect. Many approaches assume that people have a community that they are connected with, or assume that the a community they're connected with is in the same physical space as they are. Both of these things are not true for a lot of us. Some advocates for transformative justice lack knowledge of disability justice and the issues that disabled people face, and because of that can 
rely on or recommend approaches that rely on social workers or counsellors or psychologists without awareness of how those systems have a lot to make up for in a history and current practice of perpetrating harm and abuse against mentally ill people. For disabled people who have been let down again and again, judged as too hard to support or alienated from communities that refuse to address their own ableism, the idea of a system that doesn't make many concrete guarantees and relies a lot on community support can quite reasonably raise a lot of skepticism. But mainstream systems keep letting us down too. They don't work. And they don't, don't provide any image of a path towards working. In The Prison Paradox, more incarceration will not make us safer. Don Stamen, Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology at, at Loyola University Chicago wrote, Despite two decades of declining crime rates and a decade of efforts to reduce mass incarceration, some policymakers continue to call for tougher sentences and a greater use of incarceration to reduce crime. It may seem intuitive that increasing incarceration would further reduce crime. In reality, however, increasing incarceration rates has a minimal impact on reducing crime and entails significant cost. Any crime reduction benefits of incarceration are limited to property crime. Research consistently shows that higher incarceration rates are not associated with lower violent crime rates. Incarceration may increase crime in certain circumstances. In states with high incarceration rates and neighborhoods with concentrated incarceration, the increased use of incarceration may be associated with increased crime. Transformative justice is hard, and it is still being written. The moral arc of the universe is long, but we can drag it a few degrees in the right direction. Transformative justice is an opportunity to see that while we don't have all the answers yet, we can create something much better than the systems we currently have. It's an obligation and an incredible opportunity to imagine better. A huge thank you to our speakers today. Tim Lachlan, Tim Chan, Poppy Mullins, Alicia Staples, and Gahava Lillet. It takes a lot of courage and vulnerability to talk about lived experience and to share your own personal story and journey. We have all learned so much from your lived ex talks about different topics that affect young people on a daily basis. We wanted to thank you, the audience, for taking the time to listen to young people. We hope you take the experiences and thoughts shared with you today in these talks and implement them in some way in your life or work in the future. If you're a young person with disability, We'd love to stay in touch. You can follow our Instagram page called The Platform. Our handle is at the underscore platform underscore au. The platform showcases the achievements and stories of young, talented and diverse people with disability across Australia. You can also join our private Facebook group called National Youth Disability Summit 2020, which is for young people who attended the summit and also engaged with the summit resources post event. This is a safe space for young people to stay connected, share opportunities and events, and to discuss important topics and news. Or, if you prefer, you can contact us by email on info at cider.org.au to talk about the different ways you can get involved with CIDA, our events, and our programs. If you're not a young person, or you're not located within Australia, we'd still love you to stay in contact with CIDA. Get in touch via the platform, or feel free to visit our website or follow the CIDA Facebook page or Twitter page. On behalf of CIDA and the Summit Co-Design Committee, we'd like to thank you for watching LiveDex today and for giving young people the microphone.